Hey everybody, um, if you've been paying attention to the syllabus, you'll know that our next major assignment is going to be paper two. And if you've really taken a quick look at uh, the, the, the syllabus, you'll know that uh, you've got a choice this time when it comes to paper two. You've got one uh, of two books that you need to read. Uh, you can choose Richard Wright's Black Boy, uh, which is what we're gonna be going through here in a minute. Or you can choose Rodolfo Acuna's Occupied America, and there are video installments that will help you break those down as well. But the thing is, everybody, I think a lot of you got quite a bit of mileage out of those videos that I put up the last time uh, involving The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Uh, that's exactly what I was hoping would happen, that it would help you break this stuff down, because I know that those books look really intimidating, they're relatively long, and, and some of you may not know where to start. So that's more of uh, what, what you saw the last time. That's the hope that I have when it comes to what you get out of this, okay? So first things first, just like last time, I think that uh, knowing a little bit about your author goes an awful long way with respect to what you're supposed to get out of this book, okay? So if you recall the last time, I described Upton Sinclair as this progressive activist and, you know, he didn't just want you to be grossed out by the stuff that was being put in your food. Uh, didn't even really want you to just feel sorry for Jurgis or the Rudkus family by the time that you got done reading it. I think what he wanted you to do is to, to, to do something, uh, to, to, to get up and to, to participate in some form of activism to, to right what he clearly sees as a wrong. Uh, the example that I used in class, if you recall, was Theodore Roosevelt as President of the United States, kind of spitting out his breakfast uh, after reading that chapter in the jungle. And he ran down to uh, Capitol Hill and he insisted upon the passing of the Pure Food and Drug Act, which, if you remember right, kind of cleaned up some of the things that were being put in our food, okay? And so it wasn't just reading for its own sake, it was a form of activism. And I think that you can make a very similar case for Richard Wright, okay? So who was Richard Wright? Um, for those of you that have never heard of him before, he was an African-American author, a writer, and most of his stuff is going to be written in the 1930s, to some extent the 1940s, but the 1930s. So stop for just a second and think about what's happening in America in the 1930s. We're in the middle of the Great Depression, okay? And so similar to Upton Sinclair in, in the Gilded Age, right, the, 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 the times, right, the mood of the country at the time is really going to be influential to Richard Wright. And it's not just going to be seen here in Black Boy. It'll be seen in other, uh, other, other books that he will author, okay? Pretty much everything that Richard Wright produces in his career has at least something to do with race and race relations in the United States. In Black Boy, he's going to interrogate the way that race works in American society. And you'll see what I mean a little bit later. But I want to come back to something for a second, because as I mentioned before, with both Sinclair, and now you're seeing this with uh, Richard Wright as well, the political backdrop, the life and times of the era are going to be really, really influential with respect to what he ultimately produces in the book, okay? The 1930s, and especially the early days of the Great Depression, is an incredibly tumultuous, difficult time in American history. You've got capitalism on its face, and if you think back to, you know, when, when, we, when we were talking about that period in lecture, one of the things that I underscored was that there really doesn't seem to be too many people doing anything about it. You don't see a robust response out of the federal government, at least not until Franklin Roosevelt is inaugurated. You don't see a lot of activism from places like churches or self-help organizations because they're hurting as well. And it seems as though one of the only organizations in America that really seems to be doing anything, whether it's effective or not, those tend to be the radicals, right? I'm talking about people like socialists, 
really talking about people like communists. And if you think back to the Ford Hunger March or the Bonus Army, those are a couple good, vivid examples as to what I mean, okay? But keep in mind, guys, the, the essence of paper two is going to ask you to think about, you know, the role that race plays in American life. And the fact of the matter is, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, they're not only getting behind things like the Hunger March or unemployment insurance or things like that. The Communist Party in particular is practically the only predominantly mostly white organization that even recognizes inequality when it comes to racism, when it comes to racial inequality. It's certainly the only organization, uh, predominantly white organization, that is mobilizing toward the end of civil rights, okay? Um, there's another dynamic in all of this. I think one of the strengths of shall we say, the distant left in American history, especially during the 1930s and 1940s. One um, talent, for lack of a better term, that it has is to use the, the institution of culture, mass culture, to kind of convey messaging, to kind of explain to people what's important, why is important, and what ought to be done about it, okay? And again, we've, we've talked about this to some extent. Uh, we, we have talked about singers and songwriters. Uh, we've talked about athletes. Uh, we've talked about uh, comics, for that matter. And in particular, we can see this being used by the distant left to kind of mobilize for bigger, broader movement, okay? The reason that I'm telling you this is that Richard Wright is very much a product of this idea, the use of mass culture, in his case, literature and writing, to kind of bring about mobilization for a social and political cause, okay? I'm not entirely sure what my English uh, colleagues would call this. What us historians call it would be proletarian uh, literature, okay? Now, proletarian literature are books, short story, excuse me, short, short stories, and even poems that emphasize things that are near and dear to workers. Life inside the factories, unemployment, the struggles of the Great Depression, okay? Economic injustice, you, you get the idea, okay? Uh, Richard Wright has good company. You've got people like Mike Gold. You've got people like Tilly Olson and John Dos Passos that are also writing about these sorts of things as well. An author that I bet you're a little more familiar with would be a guy named John Steinbeck. And again, I'm not sure what my English colleagues would have to say as to whether or not he qualifies to be in the same sort of genre as a Dos Passos or someone like that. But the fact is, whether he's talking about the Dust Bowl or just the general trials and tribulations of the Great Depression, those are the sorts of things that Richard Wright is writing about as well. So that group, uh, uh, that, that, that genre of literature, that's, that's what this sort of falls into the category of, okay? Back to Richard Wright and cultural radicalism. As I said before, the Communist Party was very, very aware that mass culture, you know, the culture of the masses could be used to get people all on the same page and get them rowing in the same direction for progressive change, okay? There are parts in the book that Richard Wright describes. Uh, he talks about this organization uh, called the John Reed Club. Now, in case you care, or certainly to bring things into better focus, the John Reed Club is the creation of the Communist Party, and you can kind of think of it as its cultural wing. Uh, we've talked about organizations like the International Labor Defender. That was the legal wing of the Communist Party. The John Reed Clubs and pretty much every major city, certainly Chicago, had uh, a John Reed Club. And what this club would do was use culture, especially things like uh, plays, skits, poetry, uh, music, and, and absolutely writing to kind of push their messaging and explain to people what was going on and what they needed to do to change it. 
Now, this might not sound like a big deal to you, but this is an incredibly effective way to get people on the same page. I, I want you to picture something for a second, okay? Imagine that you have an opportunity to hear a world-renowned economist come in, with someone like John Maynard Keynes, come in and give a lecture to you in terms of what he thinks caused the Great Depression. Brilliant opportunity. And, and he, could, he, he, could, he could talk for over two hours, and, and, and you'd certainly be smarter for having heard that. But think about something. You got a guy like Keynes that's talking about a, a relatively dry subject, international capitalism, that sort of thing. He's going to lose your focus. Then again, you've got a guy like Woody Guthrie, who in two minutes, through a folk song, can explain to you what the Great Depression was. Uh, how it's affecting people, what needs to be done, who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and, you know, what what we're striving toward. And that's all being done, not only in, in a very fast, expedited way, but in a way that's fun to consume, okay? And so that's where organizations like the John Reed Club were trying to take this when it comes to using culture as a way to mobilize the masses. I hope that makes sense, okay? Let's talk about why this book, because let's be honest, there are numerous books that I could have assigned, but Richard Wright's Black Boy really lends itself in several very important ways. First and foremost, just like The Jungle, it is a primary source. It is his memoirs, okay? It is his first-hand account of what it was like growing up, whether that's in the rural South or the urban North, in the early parts of the 20th century. It is also an incredibly realistic depiction of American racism in one of the darkest time periods, that, that, that period after the Civil War to the end of World War II. That's one of the darkest time periods in, in American history when it comes to race relations. His earliest experiences, as you're gonna find out, are absolutely drenched with racial violence and those experiences underscore the ways that white supremacy works in the United States. Some of those ways are very casual, and some of those ways are very tangible, meaning that you can, you can literally see it. You can literally see the signs above the drinking fountains that say whites only, okay? You'll also find, uh, you'll discover, or he discovers, what happens to people that don't necessarily understand the rules. And as he's going to find out all too quickly, um, ignorance is no excuse. The fact that you simply don't know what those rules, whether they're very explicit or they're very implied, are, that's no excuse. And sometimes these results can have very, very tragic consequences, okay? But last, certainly not least, much like the jungle, this is, you know, a vehicle that's, that's very enjoyable. I don't, don't get me wrong, it's not a happy story, it's pretty depressing, then again, so was the jungle, but it's infinitely more enjoyable than, than reading some long history book. I mean, I'll go back to my John Maynard Keynes versus Woody Guthrie example from a few minutes ago, okay? So I hope that that makes some sense in terms of why this book. For right now, guys, I want to talk a little bit about ways that, you know, I might approach the paper if this is me writing it. And where I would start, because if you've looked at the question, it's going to ask you about white supremacy. And so the first thing that I really think would be effective for you is, in your own mind, establishing what white supremacy is. You've got white supremacy and you've got white supremacists, okay? Now, the two are not the same. Because when most people hear the word white supremacy, they think white supremacist, and they, th they think of white hoods and burning crosses of the Ku Klux Klan, or they think of the swastikas and uh, the Nazi party. Now, those are white supremacists, okay? White supremacy is, is, is different. White supremacy is, 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 a, is a system. And it is a system that kind of orders society based on race. And you've got people who are deemed to be white, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, that, that are up here, right? They're at the pinnacle of the pyramid, the top. 
and it goes down from there, people of color, okay? Uh, to some extent, you can make a case for racial and religious, excuse me, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities. But up here at the pinnacle, what you've got are first-class citizenship rights. Somebody reneges on a contract, you can take them to court, you can sue them, okay? If you have a problem, someone has done you wrong, you can call the police, and you can expect that the police will enforce the laws. You can vote. For the most part, you can vote without worry that it might cost you your life. You can go about your business in a political sense and not really have to have too many thoughts thereafter. You have all the resources, whether those resources are paper thin or not, okay? I think that we can all agree that there's only a very, very select few people in this country, then, now, or any time in between, that are going to really have a realistic chance of giving, getting into an elite uh, academic institution. I mean, think about some of the most elite and exclusive institutions. There's only a few people that have that. Money fixes a lot of problems. Sometimes you need social connections and so forth. But on paper, right, even the most tobacco-stained, ignorant white person would, would have an infinitely better shot of getting into one of these institutions. Okay? And so I'm hopeful that that kind of makes sense with respect to it. And the other thing that I think that you need to take into consideration would be the fact that... Um, that uh, you, you have an opportunity to improve your life. Even if that is only paper thin, you can hope for a better life to come. Now, part of white supremacy and how it works is the expectation that people of color would be deferential toward uh, white people, okay? Uh, if you're speaking to a white man, even a white man that's younger, considerably younger than me, the expectation is you refer to him as sir. If you're speaking to an African-American, right, if you happen to be of white variety, and you're speaking to an African-American man, could be considerably older than me. There's a lot of people that were not referred to as sir, let alone mister. They would refer to them as boy. And this was another way of explaining, right, unequivocally, um, unmistakably explaining to them, you're not as good as us. You're somehow inferior. In other words, white supremacy. So keep in mind, guys. Right. White supremacy is a system. It's, it's not a group of people. It is a system that is really specifically designed to keep people of color, many people, in their place. Okay, And it's a way to control people. And Richard Wright is going to kind of come to these terms. He's going to discover this over the course of his life. He'll see it in the rural south, and he'll see it in the urban north. He sees it in ways that he, he, he notices other African-American and people of color, right? People allowing themselves to be disrespected. Because keep in mind, part of surviving white supremacy, okay, a white supremacist system, is understanding how to be a person of color. Understanding, you know, the expectations uh, that were being put upon you with respect to, you know, um, how to be a racial minority in the early mid 20th century. Um, that's in, in a way a massive major theme that's going to run through uh, Richard Wright's book. Keep in mind guys, white supremacy is the bedrock of American racism and I know what you're probably thinking. Those are two of the same things except for they're not. Racism exists everywhere. They've got racism in Japan. They've got racism all throughout Europe. There's racism in Central America, and there's racism in Africa. It functions differently, sometimes radically differently, depending on exactly where you're talking about. But in the United States, and over the course of U.S. history, the way that white supremacy is structured is that people, groups of people that we might think of as races, right, are grouped together and it's all in accordance with how white they are deemed to be, okay? Now, we have had examples in this class of the Irish, of Jewish immigrants, of Italian, Polish, Russian immigrants that come over, and they're treated as second-class citizens. 
it might not be as, no pun intended, black and white, but they're certainly not treated as first-class citizens. But over the course of American history, and with respect to those groups that I just mentioned, especially after World War II, you see those groups, uh, the ethnic Americans, if you will, they begin to be absorbed into the broader white community. And those opportunities, what we might call white privileges, they begin to open up to those people that were uh, just a generation back, a second, and in some cases, third class citizen. Okay? Richard Wright picks up on this as well. It's in particular, it's in this scene where he is in Chicago working at this veterinary hospital, and he's interacting with these young Jewish doctors who just had this expectation with him that he's going to be deferential toward them. That don't ask a question. I'm not here to answer your questions. You're here to service my needs. It's, it's the, the, these Jewish immigrants, so to speak, learning how racism works and kind of exerting their whiteness, if you will, the exercise in their white privileges uh, in, in, in accordance to, to, to him. So you see this again and again and again throughout the, uh, throughout the book. So these are the approaches that I might employ if this is me writing this paper. So I want to sum up because I see the clock, we're getting, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to get a little bit uh, long there. Racism is a tool, it's a political tool, it's an economic tool, it's designed to keep people in their place. It's also designed to keep people who are in control, you know, remaining in control. If you can think about it this way, if you can keep them fighting at the bottom, then they're never going to attack the top. They're never going to come for you and your control at the top, okay? Some of the most ardent supporters that Richard Wright is going to run into with respect to supporting of Jim Crow white supremacy, these are people that are working class, right? They, they have to fight every day just to stay out of the poorhouse. They, most of them don't have two nickels to their name, but at the same time, they're some of the fiercest defenders of, of, of a system that disallows people of color access, disallows people of color, you know, first class citizenship rights. And I think a very strong case could be made that things would be better for people down here, white, black, or anywhere in between, if they united and, and, and had more of an inclusive, a more equitable society. So it, it functions as a social and political troll, control to keep those that are currently in power in power still. Okay. And again, I hope that, that sheds light on everything for you. I hope that this puts things in better perspective for you. I want to wrap up and explain some of the formatting, okay? It's, nothing has changed since the last time you wrote a paper. The formatting and the guidelines are going to be the same. This is going to be two to three pages, double space, use normal one-inch margins, use a font that is 12 point, no bigger, no smaller. Uh, the style is up to you. I like Times New Roman, but that's just me. Uh, I would like you to use MLA formatting with respect to how you cite your sources. And again, go honor code. If you're using a book that you picked up at a local bookstore, then use that page number for Richard Wright. If you're using the one that I provided, use that page number, okay? The idea is to take examples both from your reading, okay, as well as from my lecture, and when I go through some of these other installments, I'll stop and point out some of the things that we've talked about uh, in class that correspond to what Richard Wright has to say. So once again, your job is to synthesize this. It's not just to give me a book report on Richard Wright's Black Boy, okay? Provide a works cited page at the end of uh, the work because that is a good academic habit to have. Uh, I meant to mention this a second ago, but I would like your thesis statement once again to appear in bold black lettering. Your thesis statement should be the last sentence of the intro first paragraph. If there's anything that I want you to leave this class with at the end of the semester, it is that. Your thesis statement is the last sentence of the first paragraph. That's basically it. If you have any other issues, questions, concerns, you want some clarity on anything, you know how to find me. 
Uh, I will be available for office hours as usual. You can also email me and there are other ways of getting a hold of me. So I hope that this intro has been uh, helpful, helps you break down the question a little bit more effectively. If you've chosen option one here, follow me over to the next video installment, which is racial consciousness in the mid 20th century. That's what we're going to be going about doing here in just a minute. For right now, uh, good luck the rest of the way.